Hello and welcome to another edition of Active Living. We're very fortunate today to have Mr. Robert Sparks here. I should say Lieutenant Colonel Robert Sparks. And Robert is going to tell us about some of his experiences while he was in the service. And most, uh, most, of, the, most of the service I experience will be from Vietnam. So welcome to our show, Robert. Well, thank you, George. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to uh, tell my story about uh, what I experienced in Vietnam in 1969 and 1970. I'm going to talk today about my journey to Vietnam, the unit that I was assigned to, some of the places that I visited, and the events and the people of South Vietnam while I was there. Uh, I have uh, about 200 slides that I took while I was there, 35 millimeter slides, and they were converted to computer format here about 30 years ago. I don't have all 200 today. Great. <laughs> <laughs> but, That's good. but I have what I consider to be some of the best Great. Of, of that group. And um, so let's get started here. Great. So we'll cover a little bit about my brief personal military history. Uh, my actual journey to Vietnam and the unit assignment process that I went through. I'll try to give a, an overview of the Vietnam War while I was there, kind of a big picture, won't take very long. Great. I'll talk about the unit that I got assigned to. Uh, I'll talk about my platoon, the missions that we worked, and some of the working conditions that we worked under. And then, best of all, I'll have the photos of the people, the places, events, as the situation allowed. And when I say the photos, the slides. Fantastic. So, so let's just think about, uh, as we go back 55 years, and as we briefly discussed before we got started, it is almost exactly 55 years ago that I arrived there. But this is just one person's personal story. Right. Every Vietnam veteran's story is unique as their fingerprints. We were there uh, to fight the, uh, a war against the communist North Vietnam. My unit was a combat one, as it'll be very clear in the slides. My camera was only used when the military situation permitted. There's right. a lot of times I would have liked to take photos, but a, it's not, not right to get the camera out. The resolution of small 35 millimeter cameras back then is not what we're uh, used to with today's digital cameras, although these slides are pretty good and they were professionally done about 30 years ago. So, a little bit about my military resume before I ended up in Vietnam. I think the uh, audience w would find that somewhat interesting uh, about what uh, level of experience the Army gave you before they sent you to a combat zone. So I graduated in 1968 from the University of Kentucky. I had an ROTC uh, commission. Okay. I was in the two-year ROTC program, which was a little bit different than the four-year program. I uh, went to Armor Officer Basic Course at Fort Knox in the fall of 1968, was assigned to Fort Knox uh, to the 6th Battalion, 32nd Armor, 194th Armored Brigade. This is after you graduated For, you were assigned? Yeah, yes, I was assigned. Okay. And after we'd had our basic officer course, which was about nine weeks. Uh, so I was a four-deuce platoon leader uh, more, at mortars. Okay. Uh, so I was a four-deuce platoon leader. Uh, in a headquarters company and did that, got quite a bit of experience uh, doing just about every assignment that they could throw at you as a second lieutenant, the pay officer, the supply officer, the maintenance officer, the uh, 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 military, do, uh, a military uh, funeral officer, uh, so. Yeah, I was uh, there. Uh, <laughs> I did the same thing. <laughs> yep. So, received orders to go to Vietnam in April of 1969. Uh, the Army sent a number of second lieutenants and uh, higher NCOs to the Jungle Operations Training Course 
down in the canal zone of Panama. That was a two-week course. That was in June of 1969. And then in mid-July, I headed to Vietnam. So that was my background. We were, I, I was recently on a trip down to uh, that, that zone, and uh, we did go to an ex-army base down, down in that area where, the, where you might have even been trained. Yeah, that was Fort Sherman. Yeah. Fort Sherman. The, right. And it's on the north end of the canal zone. Absolutely. The canal, the canal actually runs north to south. Most people think it runs east to west. but they, it, They've taken those offer, officer quarters now and it actually made them into a beautiful hotel. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been nice when we were there, but <laughs> we, we lived in the jungle the first week we yeah, were there. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so my personal journey to Vietnam, and this was uh, 100 percent air uh, that we're talking about here. So I left Lexington, Kentucky uh, and flew to Oakland, California. All, we refueled in Hawaii and Guam and we landed in Benoit. And that from the time I lex left Lexington, Kentucky to Benoit was probably about 48 hours. We spent uh, a few days in Benoit at a replacement center uh, drawing our gear as well as uh, getting orders to move on. Uh, moving on meant going to play coup and we'll talk about that in more detail. Finally to Fan Rang and Song Mao and then finally to a little village called Long San. And uh, we'll, we'll have some slides on uh, several of these places as we get more in depth here. The total lapse time from the time I left Lexington, Kentucky to the time I landed in Long San was about seven days. Okay. So. And this is all on military air transport? This is all on military air transport. Some jets, some props, and some helicopter. So here's a, a, an area map. We flew into Benoit, which is in the lower right corner. Uh, it's uh, basically a suburb of uh, what was Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City. And that's where we spent a couple of days, Benoit. And then on to Pleiku, which is up in the Central Highlands, right on the border with Cambodia. Um, and then we flew back down to Phan Rang, which is in your lower right, uh, near the ocean there, south of Cameron Bay. Right. And then on to Song Mao, and then on to Long San, uh, which is not on the map because it's just so small. So big picture, while I was there, uh, these are official uh, U.S. Army words uh, about what was going on, and these are big picture. The drawdown had begun. Uh, the uh, head count or the strength of the forces in Vietnam and off Vietnam um, had reached a peak in April 1969, but by the time, just right after I got there, um, some of the units had gone home and we had dropped down to around 500,000 men and women. Uh, so the drawdown had, had just begun as I, as I arrived. Uh, the second campaign uh, that the Army, Army and the military recognized was that the uh, enemy continued to attack fire bases and uh, there were several separate attacks and we experienced those in the unit that I was in. And then finally, I participated in the, what was known as the Sanctuary Counteroffensive, which was the invasion of Cambodia. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so those were the three, three uh, campaigns that were going on while I was there, 69 and 70. So, after spending a couple of days in uh, uh, Benoit, we uh, board a plane and we fly to Play Coup. And Play, Play Coup on this map shows you that it's uh, right on the border there of uh, Cambodia. And this was a strategically important area for, for both sides, both the U.S. and its allies, as well as the, the communists and their allies. Uh, there was many major battles fought here. Uh, we actually uh, went on to Camp Inari, which was the headquarters of the 4th Infantry Division. And I took in-country familiarization training here. And I also returned to play coup 
uh, later on as we, uh, our, my unit participated in the Cambodian invasion. So at Pleiku, the first slide I'm going to show you is the headquarters for the Infantry Division. And there's a, there's a couple of interesting things in this photo that you don't normally see in an active combat zone. And what I'm referring to is behind that hedge fence, you see a couple of civilian vehicles in addition to the Army Jeeps uh, sitting there. You see a couple of, uh, you see a civilian vehicle on the left and a civilian vehicle on the right. Uh, right. And I, di I didn't even realize that when I took the photo, but in, in looking at them again, I saw those two photos and I thought, wow, isn't, isn't that unusual? You see a couple of, uh, one looks like about a 65 Chevy, the one on the left. I'm not sure what the one on the right is. But uh, this, is, this was the headquarters of the 4th Infantry Division. And this is the 4th Replacement Detachment. And again, these are the guys that are determining your fate, where you're going, right. <laughs> what unit you're assigned to. And they're also giving you uh, in-country uh, training, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, they have a dentist come in and they, they have you brush your teeth with fluoride for five minutes so, so <laughs> that you won't get cavities while you're out in the field. Uh, and uh, there was a great a, amount of apprehension by the five or six armor officers and uh, various uh, enlisted that had uh, come over. Uh, armor officers were being assigned to infantry uh, units. So going to an infantry division, you had a lot of trepidation that Absolutely. you too might be assigned. You're in the jungle with a gun. You, yeah, you're <laughs> on the ground. So at some point, uh, we got the good news, but we'll save that for later. So here is a, here is a bunker, um, and uh, you can see how built up the uh, 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 Campanari was. Um, had wooden wooden uh, billets that had been put together by engineers. You can see it had a speaker there on a telephone pole, all kinds of electricity. So very modern base uh, in, for an infantry base in, in a combat zone. And Did that, this base get attacked? Um, you, obviously, you, you got sandbags there. Oh I mean, yeah. Were you guys getting mortared? Uh, or? Well, I, I I'm sure it did. Uh, just because it was a big target, right. a big base. Uh, I'm sure it got mortared, it got rocket attacks. It did not while I was there, but I was okay. only there a short period of time. Uh, we, we actually moved on. Um, but uh, certainly, uh, if we had gotten mortared or rocket attacks, you would have found us in, the, in that bunker right in front of you there. Yeah. Uh, here was a, a Cobra helicopter taking flight. This was uh, one of my friends crouched down, uh, Lieutenant uh, Dick Specia. He and I had been an officer basic and we had gone to uh, Panama together. Uh, we just so happened that uh, that's the way it worked out. But anyhow, he and I uh, had uh, flown over to Vietnam together and we've kept in touch over the years. So, but this is a, uh, a Huey taking off and uh, you, can, you can see uh, how cloudy it was there in July 1969. Here is uh, Dragon Mountain at uh, Pleiku. This was uh, one of the high points uh, in terms of uh, uh, places to put uh, radio antennas and there was a number of radio antennas uh, on that uh, 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 mountain there. I'm not sure it was really a mountain. It might have been just a big hill, but yeah. they, they called it Dragon Mount. And you've got some engineers on the right there building something. They could have been building another uh, barracks or they could have been building an office building. Here we are. Uh, one of the things they did is uh, took us out and took us on a, on a patrol uh, outside the wire. And uh, this was a grenade that had been thrown into a creek. So that was uh, going off. Um, Made a good shot for, uh, for the camera. Right? Yeah, it did, it did. <laughs> uh, they uh, walked us through a bamboo forest. Uh, you quickly learn that a bam for bamboo for forest is not a place that you'd want to spend much time uh, because the bamboo is very strong, very tall, and uh, it's just hard, hard going. 
Um, we stopped for lunch, and um, this is a, a couple of lieutenants actually with their backs to us. On the left is Lieutenant Dudley Pugh, uh, and um, there's a mountain yard woman. Uh, the mountain yards uh, lived up in that area, and she was walking up uh, trying to sell us, I think, bananas, um, but some kind of fruit. Uh, you can tell that the two lieutenants sitting down there are new in country. Their uniforms are fresh. Uh, they're not dirty. Uh, they still have a, a decent looking haircut. Um, and if you could see their boots, uh, they'd probably be red. The, uh, the clay or the, the ground around uh, Pleiku was, was a red clay, okay. uh, very red. Um, so at some point while, while we're in Pleiku at the, at the uh, replacement depot, for officers, NCOs, and enlisted, uh, a number of us got an assignment to the 2nd Squadron 1st Cavalry Regiment, and it was an armored unit, and that'll become clear as we start to see some of our vehicles, but the 2nd Squadron 1st Cavalry was organized in 1833, so it, it's an old unit, uh, mm -hmm. even, even at that time. It was known as the Black Hawks, and it had participated in a number of uh, military actions starting actually in the Black Hawk War and up through World War II. So um, more on the history, uh, the 2nd Squadron 1st Cavalry was actually part of the 2nd Division, which was uh, Patton's own division, and they were stationed at the time at Fort Hood. They began uh, training as a unit for uh, Vietnam pre-deployment in mid-1966 in, in 1967, they left as a unit on okay. the U.S. Naval ship General Walker. Um, they arrived in Vietnam about a month later and they were attached to the 4th Infantry Division headquartered in Play Coup. Before I got there, in May of 69, they made the decision that they were going to move that unit to the first field force, which was headquartered in the Trang. Uh, but we got sent to the 4th Infantry Division for the in-country training. They were still doing the in-country training during a transition period. This uh, unit that I was assigned to stayed in Vietnam for a little over three years. They stood down in October 1970 and returned okay. to Fort Hood. Here's a picture of the General Walker that they went over on. Now this is the, uh, the enlisted people came over on this ship? Yeah, the enlisted and, and the officers. As well? Uh, as, as well, okay. and the equipment. All, but, the, all the tanks and PCs. But you, we, well, you left, but you, you were arrived by airplane. Yes, I was an individual replacement. Okay. At, at some time in 1967 or 68, the decision was made that we're not sending any more full units to Vietnam. Okay. It'll just be replacements. Okay. So just a little bit about the General Walker. It uh, was built in 1944, launched in 44. Uh, it participated in three Korean War and three Vietnam campaigns, and it was actually scrapped in 2004. Uh, it was a big ship, and actually it carried not only the second of the first cavalry to Vietnam, it had the first of the first cavalry. So there was two uh, cavalry squadrons that okay. went, went over on uh, this uh, particular ship. Uh, here's just an overview of what an armored cavalry squadron looked like. It had a headquarters troop, it had three armored cavalry troops, and I was assigned to one of those, and it had an air troop. Uh, its strength was about 850 men. The armored cavalry troops were named Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie, the phonetic, the phonetic yeah. alphabet. They had tanks, they had ACAVs, which are armored PCs, they had tank retrievers and wheel vehicles. Each troop had three operational platoons like the one that I was assigned to. We had an air cavalry troop that had Hueys, Loaches, and Cobras. We had a whole, uh, headquarters troop which had, of course, the CO, the XO, the staff sections, right. um, which 
uh, our, your typical. Here are some of the, the badging that uh, our, our branch was cavalry. Here's the 1st Cavalry Regiment uh, uh, badge that we also wore. Some other badging here. We, we did not wear those things, but it's part of our history. Uh, here's the patches that uh, we wore. Um, the unit came from the Hell on Wheels, which was Patton's own 2nd Division. Uh, initially, I wore the 4th Infantry badge, uh, and uh, after that, we started wearing the 1st Field Force badge. So, from Fan, or from Pleiku, rather, we are uh, flown down to Fan Rang. And Fan Rang is an interesting city uh, near the coast there, and you can see it on the map. It uh, was um, uh, occupied by the Japanese, and they, they built an airfield there. The airfield was in turn used by the French, and the uh, airfield was expanded by the U.S. They had F-100s there. They had the, uh, the night uh, planes. I'm talking about the Spookies and, mm -hmm. and Puff the Magic Dragons. Uh, this place was known as Happy Valley. Uh, you might say, well, how could any place in Vietnam be <laughs> known as Happy Valley? Well, it was because they didn't get attacked very often there. So uh, it was uh, uh, a good place to be, especially right. if you were in the Air Force. Um, so we had our rear headquarters there, and we've got some slides of Fan Rang. Here, here we are, uh, I was in a helicopter at this time, flying over, and it was a, a fairly modern uh, city. Compared Looks like a typical city. Uh -huh, yeah, uh, compared to some that you're gonna see. Here is a Huey helicopter la landing on the, uh, the pad there at our rear headquarters. And you, uh, you can see the mountains frequently here as, as we uh, um, go through these photos around Fan Rang. Right. Here is the uh, second squadron cavalry uh, rear headquarters. Uh, this was actually built probably uh, three to four years before we occupied it. Uh, we had about 20 people here um, uh, because it was a major airfield. We would shuttle people through here and um, on to R&R &R or going home or where, wherever they needed to go. This, this would be the, the place that you would go. And right. a, a couple of times I had to fly up here on business and uh, uh, spent the night here. So it was a uh, a place that looked had some wear and tear at this point. Uh, here was uh, uh, the uh, perimeter, um, and um, we were right outside the airbase. Um, in fact, the airbase uh, ran security patrols with dogs at night, right right underneath that guard tower, um, as they were patrolling. Here was a bunker. You can see. <laughs> How, how old this bunker is. The sandbags are falling apart. There's yeah. grass, grass growing on top of the bunker. Here is the air base, and contrast that with what you just saw in the sense that this has got uh, electricity, it's got paved roads, it's got air conditioned billets. Well, it, it, running water probably. Run, oh, right? running water, flush toilets, yeah. uh, all the comforts of home. So yes, the air the air force lived well compared to the army. Uh, here's just another shot of uh, the air base, metal metal buildings, um, and you can see some of the Vietnamese people that were working on the base there. The women, uh, uh, the U.S. forces, of course, employed a, a lot of the locals that would come in, and typically uh, they'd have cleaning jobs, and they would. They would uh, have uh, lawn care jobs and that, that kind of thing. They so, weren't concerned about any kind of sabotage? Uh, not, not, not from the people uh, that uh, came on to work. They, they, they'd been cleared. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm sure some of them uh, uh, told, told their friends uh, back home what, what the Americans were doing. Uh, so I'm sure there was intelligence gained by, 
by those that came on base, but uh, we weren't, weren't afraid of the sabotage, no. Um, here was the mountains to the west of Fan Rang. Uh, you'll see a lot of mountains. Uh, I'm not really sure what was happening here. Uh, it may have been aquaculture, uh, but um, it um, was, was an interesting photo. <laughs> the, the two pools of water are about the same. Um, I don't think it was rice growing, so I suspect it was aquaculture, or it could have been a reservoir uh, mm -hmm. for just uh, drinking water. Um, so from Fan Rang, um, we're, we're headed to Song Mao, and it's a, a, a short flight down to Song Mao. Probably didn't take more than about a half an hour. Uh, the special forces were there, and, and my unit actually ended up taking over the area that the special forces had had. Um, the, the infantry had been there uh, back in 1967 and 68. Uh, there had been uh, a, a battle fought by the 7th and the 17th Cavalry uh, near Song Mao, and there was a, a Medal of Honor given to Sergeant Ray McKibben. Uh, uh, for his actions. Um, in Song Mao, we had the Mac B District Advisor, who was a colonel. So okay. he, he was, uh, um, and I don't know that I ever met him. We, uh, he, he had an Arvin Infantry Battalion station there, and that's the South Vietnamese Army. Of course, we had our forward headquarters there, and that lasted until the Cambodian invasion. We, we left Song Mao yeah. uh, to participate there. Here's, here's what our base camp looked like. It's right there in the center. Uh, it was uh, built by the Special Forces back in 1963. Um, here's uh, the uh, adobe brick uh, fence that was uh, around the base camp. Uh, and you can see we had a, uh, a sign up showing who our commanders had been up to the time I arrived there. My first CO was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ferry. Here is the uh, airstrip at uh, Song Mao. It had uh, perforated steel plate or yep, planking just there. Just like in World War II. Yeah, just like World War II. Right. Down, down at the end of the top fo uh, photo is the refuel point. Uh, there's some uh, helicopters coming in and on both sides there, we were probably doing some kind of lift out of troops. Here's a caribou landing. You can really get a good view of the steel plate yep. there. Uh, here's the water point. This is where we got our water. We had an Army uh, purification unit that came down okay. and purified the water for us. Uh, in fact, I think that, uh, no, I, I was thinking that they may be up there on the road to the right of the bridge, but I don't think they are. They were on that particular day. But that's where we got our water, and it was purified. And this was a uh, Chinese uh, temple there in Song Mao. I just thought that was an interesting uh, Chinese. Folk. Chinese, yeah. The writing, the, the writing on the front is Chinese. Interesting. Yep. So we move on to Long San, and um, it was a small village. That was where B Troop was. Uh, uh, headquartered. We shared the base with uh, some artillery and an Arvin company. There was a five-man MACV uh, uh, advisor team there. The base had been attacked right before I got there, and the first platoon of B Troop had had been just decimated. Um, here was a picture of uh, of uh, our, actually our area of operations, and Long Son is right dead center, just from the very top, Song Mao would be to your right, and Fan Thiet, Fan Thiet would be down to your lower uh, left. And we'll talk about Fan Thiet here in just a little bit. Here was the main entrance to the fire base, and you can tell that we're in the rainy season in July because of the water, the puddles there, and uh, so. Now, why uh, do you call it a fire base? Well. Typically, they're called fire bases when they have artillery there. Okay. So there was three 105 guns, okay. U.S. guns there. Uh, here was the ammo dump on the base. 
Here was a, 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 AV, a CAV coming in just right near the a, uh, ammo dump and you have a uh, ground guide in front anytime you had these uh, large vehicles moving among people you had to have a ground guide just to, to help you park your vehicle or back your vehicle out. Here was uh, the B Troop headquarters area. You, again, you can see the guard tower and those little uh, V-shaped uh, funny looking objects uh, left center, those uh, were actually the covers on top of the underground bunkers where we had, okay. had our headquarters. So uh, headquarters actually underground. Underground, yes. Yeah. Here was some of the areas that we uh, pulled into around the firebase. The chain link was to detonate uh, rocket propel grenades if they were fired at us. So hopefully the chain link would detonate those before right. they would hit the tanks or our or, or, or ACAVs. Uh, here was uh, the highway, the airstrip, and Hill 100. Uh, you can see some Hondas going going down. Um, that was a favorite means of transportation by the locals. And the Hill 100 in the background there is where my platoon spent uh, about the first month of nights while I was there. And the idea was that if the firebase got attacked, right. that uh, we would run down and uh, do a counterattack. So here was a Chinook that had landed, must have had a maintenance concern. You can see on the on the uh, rear that the panel has been dropped down. They're looking at one of the rotors or one of the engines perhaps. The children from uh, the local oh, yeah. community had showed up and uh, were wondering what was going on. Of course, the people that were riding on the, on the Chinook got out and were taking a look. So my own story, I ended up being the the platoon leader of the third platoon. We had 45 troopers, we had three tanks, six A calves, and we had a mortar track, and we, we had radios. And I also, while I was there, was the support platoon leader back in headquarters troop, and then I came back to B troop for the Cam Cambodian invasion. Uh, quickly, here's just what a, what a platoon looked like uh, with the, uh, the vehicles. Right, um, and here's an actual picture of platoon I took on the last day that I was a platoon leader and lined them all up there on the airstrip, and we uh, got a picture right before we took off. Here was my personal vehicle uh, while I was the platoon leader, and uh, there was actually a couple of uh, platoon uh, troopers uh, cooking a meal, and some of the locals showed up to see what we were cooking there. And you can see the back end of the, uh, the uh, vehicle. I'm sure we were in the process of uh, cleaning it out and it had gotten uh, kind of disorganized. So what kind of armament, armament did that, that type of vehicle have? It, it doesn't look like it was, uh, it would resist much fire. Well, it had, a, had an aluminum uh, hull okay. and it was, uh, it was, uh, it, it would uh, probably stop a 50 caliber round, but it would not stop an, a rocket propel grenade. Right. Go right okay. through it. Go right through it. It had a 50 caliber there on the front, and it had two M60s on either. You know, had an M60 on either side as uh, armament uh, or arms, I should right. say. Here, here was the platoon sergeant's tank. Um, that, this was Bravo 3-6. Uh, here we are, probably near. Whiskey Mountains, which we'll talk about. Um, so we, we had a lot of missions. The main mission was reconnaissance. We um, guarded the engineers quite often. You'll see several times about that. Later, uh, while I was there, we got involved in dismounted patrols and what I call hump missions, where we were sent out for extended duration missions. Our working conditions were difficult. Um, I could get into this, but it, they were just very difficult. Um, we uh, were dirty most of the time. We only had one hot meal a day. Uh, we, were, we were working 24-7. We had no days off. The only, only time we actually had off was Christmas, um, and that was because we were pulled into a fire base. Um, another place that we went was uh, Fantiette. 
and this was the capital of the province that we were in. And uh, Ho Chi Minh had lived there, so it uh, was somewhat of a sacred place. Um, and he also taught school. The uh, town had a distinctive smell because of the nook mom, which is fish sauce. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> it sounds terrible to me. <laughs> it, it was terrible. And uh, uh, there were some other units there, and we spent Christmas 69. Uh, talk a little bit about the weather. Uh, it was hot there. <laughs> that's, that's what we should say. It, ne it. It, never, it never got cold. The rainy season ran from May through October, and the relative humidity was always high, anywhere from 75 to 85, and there was a lot of sunshine. So uh, it was uh, uh, hot and humid. Here was a graveyard as we were going into Fan Thiet. You can see they, can, they buried them both beneath the ground as well as on top of the ground. Uh, one time we had the opportunity to go in to Fan Thiet, uh, in our vehicles, and this was a movie theater. And you can see how the people were dressed and all the motorcycles and bicycles that were near the mo movie theater. Here's, here was another Chinese compound that we passed by. Hmm. Here was a, a picture of LZ Betty at Fan Thiet, and this is the first to the fifth, 50th Mech Infantry was uh, here. And uh, this was a, a picture as we were taking off. This was a, a giant erosion area, area at uh, LZ Betty where the, the uh, bank had collapsed, and just a huge area. I wonder what that might look like today, 50 years later. Yeah. <laughs> Here was some of the beautiful beaches at Fan Thiet. We did get to enjoy these uh, during Christmas 1969. Uh, today these are uh, resort I'm sure towns. Probably and, the high rise rose, yep, uh, hotels yep, there now. Yep. Here's a uh, D Troop. This was one of our own uh, uh, Loach, which was an observation hel helicopter. Um, and then I did get a chance uh, when I was assigned to headquarters troop to go up to Fan Ri. It was a, a beautiful area, as you'll see here. Uh, it had nice beaches, uh, had a lot of boats there, and these were all fishing boats. Um, and it was just a nice, nice little town. Uh, they mined uh, salt. They would bring the salt water in and uh, let it let it dry out. And mm -hmm. they, they would have salt mines there. Right. And you can see salt mines in different stages there. Those in the distance, uh, you can see a lot of salt. And those closer up, not as much. Uh, here's some of the fishing boats. And the guys were building some fishing boats while we were there. So I spent some time in the Li Hong Fong Forest. This was an area north of Phan Thiet, triple canopy jungle. It had been sprayed with Agent Orange. We were sent in there with the, uh, a company of uh, the infantry from the 101st Airborne to guard the engineers. And the engineers were busting brush and knocking down uh, some of the jungle. We, uh, b uh, we, the U.S., built a, uh, a uh, rapid access into the jungle. Uh, they cut a wagon wheel so that if they found the VC or NVA, uh, we had a rapid means of getting to th that point in the jungle. Uh, didn't work out as well as we had hoped. Uh, here's uh, a cleared area that uh, they had just knocked down. Here's a D7 tractor with a, a, a working, and there's an infantryman from the 101st Airborne working, walking by there, and you can see uh, all the gear that he was carrying. Um, and the purpose of knocking down the jungle was to uh, allow you to get to some place quicker. R right. Yeah, okay. they, they cut a wagon wheel in the jungle. Okay. Uh, okay. But as it turns out, the uh, VC and NVA mined these cut areas. Yeah, I'm sure so, they did. So, so here was the nighttime perimeter for the engineers. They pushed up a couple of walls of sand, uh, so they, they created some distance. So if they were gonna be attacked, you'd have to come across two walls of sand. Right. And here was inside their nighttime perimeter. And again, it gives you the size of, of what they were working with in terms of uh, the, the uh, D7 tractors. 
Here's what it looked like once they knocked it down uh, from a ground view. And as long as you were going in the direction of, of how these things were knocked down, it wasn't too, too bad. If you tried to go against the grain, it was, it was very difficult. Yeah. Uh, here, here was an air view after they were done. And okay. You, you, so, okay, we spent some time at Whiskey Mountain. It was a very d distinctive uh, terrain uh, feature. Uh, there was engineers there, they were road paving, they got attacked. Um, and we traveled in the Li Hong Fong to get there. Um, this was uh, uh, a very important area because it had a radio relay station. Here's what it looked like on right in the center, is what, what it looked like on a, a topographical map. Here's what it looked like in the distance. Here's, uh, we had just arrived, and I know that because we're pulling that trailer. And uh, we had just arrived. Uh, from coming through the, the Li Hong Fong, and the engineers had, had cut uh, a lot of the vegetation down to make it uh, easier to defend that mountainside. Right. Here, here's some of the engineer vehicles up on, on the mountainside and some of the tents they had. Um, here you can see uh, the radio relay on the top of the mountain. Uh, Here's what it actually looked okay, like. Yeah. Now I didn't take this picture. This came off the internet, but that's that's what it looked like on top of the net. Yep. Uh, our radios were very important to us. Uh, that goes without saying. We used them to communicate and and get everything done that we needed to do. Right. Because we right. were we were independent platoons. Uh, here is a, an interesting road clearing uh, set of slides. This was uh, north of Fan Thiet. It was an area called Thien Jiao, and it was uh, a VC NVA controlled area. Here we are going down the road, and I'm sitting in the commander's tr uh, track. You can see the 50 caliber <laughs> pointing out. Oh, yeah. And, and, yeah. and this was actually a good day for several reasons, in the sense that you see people on the road, and you'll see people out as we go through these slides, which tells you that they know that there's probably nothing going to happen. So in front of me, way in front of me there is another PC, and right. there's, there's probably a tank in front of that PC. Uh, so here's some children out waving at us, another good sign. This is uh, an area that the people are doing subsistence living. Uh, the rice harvest is going on. They're in the, in the uh, processing the rice at this point. This is uh, January of uh, 1970. Uh, so here's the other side of the road, and there's Whiskey Mountain again. Yep. Uh, here's uh, another good sign, somebody moving on the road. You, again, you can see people out uh, on the uh, uh, left side there. Here was a, a guy doing something. you some guys of, hit many mines in, uh, in your travels like that? Uh, yes, yes we did, and we'll, we'll talk about that here in just a second. Okay. But here's a, a guy doing some, some kind of rice processing. It looks like he separated the rice from the, the, the stalk that it grows right. on, right. and he's got it uh, laying out there to dry. Here's some locals. Uh, this was the local mi militia. They, uh, they were just taking it easy, sitting under a shade tree. You can see how they're dressed. They got their boots off. They're just uh, uh, waiting to get their hours in and go home. Yep. Here was an area that B Troop got uh, sent to. They were dismounted. It was the uh, only way in was chopper. Only way out was chopper. Uh, that trail was very dangerous right down there. You probably would not want to be on that. Uh, very tough uh, area. I was the support platoon leader at the time and flew out uh, water and mail and meals to uh, the B Troopers that were there. So let's talk about the men. Uh, there was 45 men in the platoon. Um, they were just your average uh, people. Um, we had uh, um, some that were draftees, some were high school grads, some had college, some were married. Most of them had been there about six months and they'd all come in as individual replacements. I had six African-American troopers. I had a Vietnam teenager that joined us and we had a former VC, a guy by the name of Mao, who, 
who came over in the Chuhoi program. When you say they came over, does it mean that they just cooperated with you guys, or uh, did it mean that they became uh, in the army, or? They, they, the U.S. had a, U.S. and the South Vietnamese Army had a, had a program where they uh, recruited the, for, the former VC and NVA, and they came on the payroll, I would say, of the South Vietnamese Army, and they were assigned to platoons like mine. We used them in road clearing. Since they had set mines and so forth, we, when we did road clearing, we would put like Mao down on the ground and help him or ask him to help us find mines and signs of where, th you know, there might be an ambush. Right, so, right, right. So, okay, so in the platoon, this was a picture uh, of us before we went on patrol. I'm fourth from the right. Uh, Davy is third from the left. And Mao is peeking around the back of the guy that is second from right, if you follow me there. Yep. Okay. So there we are getting ready to go out on a patrol. Here's uh, my driver, uh, one of the track commanders, and our medic. Uh, here is one of my gunners and my driver again. Here we are filling seat, uh, sandbags. This is another one of my medics and my driver and myself. I actually, lieutenants did some work occasionally. Here was Davy when we were at uh, uh, Fan Theat on the beaches at Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's a couple of guys that, believe it or not, are from Michigan, Frank Gracie and Ben Cheddar. Looks ben, like Budweiser beer, too. Bud, uh, yeah, it was. <laughs> and Ben Cheddar lives in Clarkston, of all things, and I see him a couple times a year. Oh, is that right? Yeah. That's isn't, fantastic. Isn't that amazing, huh? Yeah. Uh, here's Rick Cantlin. Uh, he was the, the MACV advisor on our base. He and I had a history. He was in my ROTC summer camp platoon back in 67, and he was also at uh, the Canal Zone at Fort Sherman with me. Now, did you, uh, did you have any uh, drinking problems or drug problems with these people? Uh, we had some marijuana problems. Uh, we occasionally uh, had somebody that might get drunk, but uh, we didn't get beer that often, so no. that, that wasn't, wasn't well, as you'll much say, with, with 100 degree temperatures and 90 degree t t humidity, beer would have been, cold beer would have been great. It, it was <laughs> when we got it, but we didn't always get it. Here was a picture uh, taken when we were working with some of the South Viet Vietnamese, and we've got two uh, Mac V advisors in that, uh, Lieutenant Hungo, and. Sergeant First Class Braxton and myself. Here with some of our dogs, we've got Smokey, who was on my track, and there's Snoopy on the, the right, and that's the, the son on the left, the mother on the right. We had a lot of dogs. Sleeping mm. accommodations, we typically slept on a cot. Here, here was what it uh, looked like uh, at one place. Here's what Hill 100 looked like. That was a two-man bunker there. Another two-man bunker at Song Mao. Uh, this was, I think, uh, in the Li Hong Fong Forest, perhaps. Uh, here was uh, south of uh, B Troop when we were uh, guiding, uh, uh, guarding some artillery during the rice harvest. And this was uh, an actual bunker in Song Mao that I eventually had. So you asked the question, uh, about landmines, and they, these were a constant threat. When we hit a landmine, it typically destroyed the vehicle. We had, we had to turn it in and get another vehicle. I lost two tracks to landmines, I lost two ACAVs to landmines, and I lost one A ACAV to bad judgment involving water. Here, here How was about a, people? Huh? How about people? No, no people. Very, you didn't lose any people? Didn't lose any people. Man, oh man, you were yeah, lucky. Yeah, I was very fortunate. Uh, here, here's a Bravo 3.5 that hit a, hit a mine. This, this was actually the first vehicle that I lost to a mine. Uh, here's, here's the rear view of it, and the track commander walking yep. up and kicking the track. Here's the, the mine hole. It was, it was probably a 105 artillery round. Here's a Bravo 3.8 Ben Cheddar that you saw a picture of earlier. Uh, we were coming out of LZ Sandy, or Sherry rather, 
in uh, January of 1970, and it hit a mine, blew it off. There's the mine hole, again, probably a 105 round. Here was uh, Bravo 32 that took a swim, and uh, we lost that one to water. Here's a tank retriever, and when you had a problem that involved a tank, you had to call the tank, tank retriever. It was the only, only vehicle that really could uh, recover a tank. So the children of war, um, the children were very curious, and any, any time we were near a village and uh, they had the opportunity to come out, they'd come out selling Cokes. They like to sell Cokes. Really? Cold Cokes at a dollar a piece. Uh, and they, they would sell a lot of them. So I bet here, they would. Yeah, yeah. Here's, here's the girls and boys. And their mothers would come out, and the mothers would typically do our laundry. They would wash our laundry, press it, and bring it back to us. Fantastic. Yep. Yeah. So. Here's some boys, and if you look very closely, these boys are jumping up. There's a piece of candy just right above their outstretched hands. Okay. They're jumping for uh, a Hershey's uh, jungle candy, uh, chocolate candy bar. Those things, uh, uh, they didn't melt, but they didn't taste very good. Uh, but that's what the boys were jumping for. Here's a couple of girls near uh, Thien Jiao, uh, north uh, of, uh, Fantiet, uh, you'll see him again here with some boys. Um, we got about five minutes. Okay, left. that's good. Here's uh, we got visited by airline stewardesses. Oh and, yeah, and look Sheila. at that. Yeah, <laughs> the airline stewardesses in the center. That's Sheila uh, Cool, who was a TV actress. She played on the Many Loves of Dobie Gillis. Oh really? And she wow. also she also became a uh, congressman from California. Did you have any entertainment like uh, no. Bob Hope come in? You know, no. we had the, we had the fortune of uh, for, uh, fortunate to have Bob Hope show come up to Newfoundland when I was there. No, it was we cool. were, we were not big enough. No, we were we, and we were just spread out all over the place. So it really didn't lend itself. Here's uh, a flare being shot up at night. Here was a mad minute with uh, flares. You can see 50 calibers and yeah. tracers and all that. Here was spooky. Uh, and this probably came out of uh, Fan Rang. These were converted uh, C-47s that they put mini guns in, and we had these flying around us many times at night. This is 6,000 round per minute Gatling yep. gun? Gatling gun, yep. yep, that's correct, George. Uh, and uh, they, they made quite the sound. Oh, yeah. And you always wondered, who are they shooting at, or what are they shooting at? Um, and I never got asked to go, go uh, look in an area that they shot up, uh, but uh, yeah, that's an amazing gun. It really is. So the memories uh, of my time um, as the platoon leader, uh, we rode to work. That was a good thing. We didn't yeah. ha we didn't have to walk. We didn't have to carry a bunch of stuff. We could carry it in our vehicles. We had great firepower and maneuver capability. The VC and NVA could hear you coming, and many of the times they, they didn't want to mess with you. They disappear. They, they disappear. <laughs> yeah. They, they uh, uh, didn't want to fight. Um, and uh, as, as you probably figured out, the uh, platoon leader position was probably pretty stressful. I'm <laughs> it, sure it, it was. was. It was very stressful. I'm sure it was. Because you're on, you on duty 24-7. Um, and you've already touched on one of the best memories that I have of my time in the third platoon, and that is we didn't suffer any fatal casualties during, during my time as a platoon leader. And uh, all those that served with me, um, as far as I know, went home. That's uh, fantastic. So the camera I used, uh, this is just a little, little camera I bought at the PX. I think I yeah. probably paid about 15 bucks for it. I shot uh, Kodachrome film and uh, sent it to Hawaii to have them develop. Uh, they had a special thing for GIs, and uh, I, think, I think it cost maybe a dollar to buy the film yeah. and the development, and they sent them back to you. Oh, all, that right? All for a dollar, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, this was the camera I used. And uh, I had a little 35 millimeter Petrie. It was something like that. Yeah. The same thing. But, so. Uh, here I, here I am at uh, 
Campanari. You can see uh, the S4 shop from the second of the first cab in the background. I've just arrived. My uniform is clean. Yeah, you uh, look great there. I'm getting ready to take off on my big adventure. Yeah, <laughs> you, look, look, you look fantastic there. So overall experience, would you say this, uh, you know, added to your, uh, your, your life in terms of being a good leader and about the, the, the positive side of it? Uh, or do you say that, or would you say that it kind of took a, you know, three, two years out of your life that you could have probably spent somewhere else? Well, it, uh, b both, both things. I, I, I think uh, I could have spent somewhere else for the year, but uh, it was a, a year of a lot of, lot of growth. Yeah, uh, I'm sure. You know, I've, I found out that I was capable of doing a lo lot of things that I didn't know that I was uh, capable of doing, and I decided to stay in the military uh, as a reservist and, and in the Guard uh, for 20 years. That's great. So uh, I got some additional education as a result of that. Yeah. So it, uh, to answer your question, there, there was two sides to it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I found the same thing. I, I, I find that, w that it was uh, a, a great opportunity to, uh, to display your leadership, and uh, especially when you're working with a group of, uh, group of other people. But uh, yeah, it was, it, to my, in my experience, it was a good experience. Being in Vietnam might be a little different. <laughs> so anyway, well, I want to thank you so much for joining us. You've had a, a fantastic uh, a presentation that you've put together here about your, your experiences. Is there any final thoughts that you have before we kind of wrap this up, Robert? Well, uh, yes, George. Uh, thank you for allowing me to uh, put this presentation together and, and give it to the, the viewers on your channel. And uh, I enjoyed uh, doing it. And uh, hopefully we can come up with some other ones that we might want to show your viewers. Great. Thank you much, very much for joining us. And uh, we'll see you again the next time. Thanks, thanks again, folks.